The Last Word with Stan Collymore. Stan Collymore! As it is. Instead of tweeting and putting on Instagram that Collie Moore's this and Collie Moore's that, go and tell us. No holes barred. Pure, unadulterated Collie Moore. And Stan Collie Moore strikes. A happy Monday to one and all, and a very warm welcome to The Last Word with me, Stan Collie Moore. I'm back. I hope you're as excited as I am on this beautiful Monday morning ahead of the Premier League season. I've been active. In the transfer window already delighted, Hugh Wizzy joins the team with one more big signing under wraps for now. But we'll be done before Lukaku moves to Inter, guaranteed. Every Monday we'll take a look back at the main talking points from the Premier League weekend. Perfectly crafted interviews with giants of the game like Jurgen Klopp. Now I have an idea of how I want to play football and again that's selfish because I, I want to play the football I like to see. Finishing off with the quirkiest stories from around planet football. This is The Last Word with Stan Collymore. We're back baby. We're rocking and rolling. Come on! The Last Word with Stan Collymore. We're delighted to have CT1, the UK's number one sealant and adhesive on board this season. Great to have you guys on board. The first choice for tradesmen and DIY enthusiasts. It doesn't smell like most sealants. It bonds practically anything. It's stronger than an aluminium weld. So make sure CT1 is your first choice sealant and adhesive. The last word. I'm absolutely delighted to uh, firstly bring you the last word with Stan Collymore. Um, the reaction has been quite incredible. We have gone to number one, not just in the sport charts, beating some fantastic podcasts like Sunday Supplement, Peter Crouch's podcast, of course, but number one in the overall charts before you even hear my voice. So thank you guys subscribing on Spotify, on iTunes. It's all there. Have a look on my um, Twitter profile and uh, the link will be at the top. Tell your friends if you're enjoying it. If you like the big man back with unfiltered football opinion then uh, join us every single week. What a way to start a Monday, top of the charts. Delighted to be joined by Guna Extraordinaire, who's going to be one of my wingmen. We've got somebody else in line as well. I'm, like I say, I'm going to make a summer signing. Hugh Wizard, Hugh, delighted that you can join us uh, this season on The uh, on the Last Word. I'm a massive fan of your broadcasting. Uh, obviously, very Arsenal-centric. Arsenal, -centric. Arsenal uh, Twitter is a big, big thing. You're wearing red and white today. Um, very briefly, I want you to talk to me about Arsenal at Barcelona yesterday. Because I saw, was it Martinelli down the right, Saka down the left. The youth there, but the problems continue. Leadership, bottle, all of those things. You, you're wincing. I mean, first things first, absolutely over the moon to be involved, Stan. Thanks for having me. Um, as you say, massive Arsenal fan. And yesterday we were at the Camp Nou for the Jaune Camper Trophy. Would you have had that as a trophy? We're asking the question a little bit later on. We're going to do a full pre-season, um, uh, full Premier League season preview. All 20 clubs. We've got our magic hat here. We're going to be plucking out. But the question that I asked at Wembley yesterday was is the Charity Shield a trophy. Arsenal would have took the, the, the Juan Gamper yesterday as some signs of progress. Not only would they have taken it, but I really do I want to make a case for these games not just being pre-season friendlies. These are the curtain raisers for the season. And in most other countries, Supercoppa Italia or the Super Cup in Spain, they take them much more seriously than we do here. And I think if you speak to the managers and the players who were involved yesterday, they definitely would have wanted to win. I see the look on uh, Bravo's face when he saved the penalty. He's screaming to the high heavens, looked absolutely over the moon. Obviously, he's had a bit of a torrid time at City, so to be the the hero on the day is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, but it's not a trophy that you stick. I mean, Manchester City were calling themselves the Formidables last year. Uh, because They're obviously... looking for a new name because uh, no, they can't no, be the Invincibles. It's like, okay, the Premier League, yes, major trophy, 38 games. You're looking at the League Cup, the FA Cup, varying degrees, five games, six games to win it. But really, the charity shield where goals don't uh, count to your tally, that would disappoint me as a central striker. Um, it, it is not regarded, uh, or never has been in the 90 odd years that it's been taking place as a major trophy. So, these pre season tournaments, why are we getting so hung up on them being important? I think for City, especially, because they're trying to create history, create a legacy. The longer that they can go on this winning stretch of run, I mean, it's an unbelievable run. Seven out of the last domestic, uh, eight domestic trophies on offer they've won. Um, 
I think this this really helps their cause. And again, it's Pep getting one over Klopp, which might seem like a small thing, but ultimately it's a real battle of two of the greatest to po- possibly have ever done it. Certainly in the in the game right now. So it, for me, I do I don't want to count it as a major trophy, but I really do think it deserves a little more respect than it gets. Well, I was in the uh, Wembley press room yesterday. I uh, spoke to some legends and luminaries of the game. Uh, first up, um, we've got Jan Argafjortoft. He used to play for Sheffield United in the Norway national team in the mid-90s. Jan Molby, uh, the legend, used to stand on the halfway line and ping balls left, right and centre. Uh, a, a bony Friday Liverpool legend. And Nigel Spackman played for Liverpool with Jan Molby and, of course, Chelsea. We asked them the simple question, is the charity shield a trophy worth winning? I think the big thing, Stan, is, uh, you know, if you're a winner, you want to be a winner and you, whatever competition you're in, you want to win it. And I think that's for the managers today. They want to win this trophy. I think for the players, they want to win it. The fans, certainly Liverpool fans want to win it. I've talked to them outside. But for me, it's a trophy to win. You want to win it. And also, I think the big thing for Liverpool is to get one over on your closest rivals, Man City, and get the confidence going in the season that you can beat Man City. Because as uh, Jan Mulby was saying, my old teammate, he was just saying, well, Liverpool got a really good record against Man City at the moment but in the big games at Anfield where it was very cagey nil 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 you remember Mahrez missed a penalty they could have won it at uh, City it was very close they just nicked it and that was the difference at the end of the season was that win that City got at home they won the league and that's how tight it had been again this season I think there's only Man City and Liverpool who are capable of winning the title this year I think you should uh, I think you should. And if you see in Germany last night, they played Dortmund against Bayern Munich, a fantastic game of football. Dortmund winning it, celebrating it. This is the first se- is trophy of the season, although <laughs> Bayern Munich will end up winning both. But I think this is special today because you have the champions of Europe, champions of England, and this is a new rivalry in, in English football. And Pep against Klopp. So, yeah, it's a lot to play for today. I think it's very difficult. Uh, I, I generally think it's one of those shields that if you win it, it's worth it. Uh, and if you don't and whoever loses today managers I'm talking about will probably come out and say it isn't that important what's important is is next week so we heard from Jan Mulby Jan Fjortoft and Nigel Spackman Hugh um, my opinion on this is very simple of course you want to win every competition that you enter but pre-season as a professional footballer is about fitness preparation sharpness um And having been at Wembley yesterday, that's all that matters. Yes, you lift the community shield, but nobody's going to care. Every single team in the top flight uh, in the Premier League would swap a million charity shields for an opening day win. The mantra is, as a professional footballer in every dressing room that I played in, do not lose the game. Just have a look at the tail of the tape between Liverpool and Manchester City yesterday. 17 shots for the Redmen, uh, 8 for Manchester City. A lot of those came obviously late in the game when Liverpool were dominant. 9 shots on target to Manchester City's 3. Um, in your opinion, who's going to be the happier? Uh, take the, the, the trophy aside and whether we think it has real teeth and real importance. Um, you saw the game yesterday. I was at uh, Wembley yesterday. What are your opinions on what you saw? Like you said, I really do think the most important thing about the game in general is fitness levels. And I guess towards the last 15, we really saw the City players being stretched to their limit. Um, I think that that's going to be good and serve them well come first day of the season. But then for Liverpool, who dominated the second half, they will take a lot away from it positively because so many of their top players have been away at African Cup of Nations or just on a break that, you know, there were a lot of positives to take from it. I feel like they really should have won the game, in fact. If it wasn't for Carl Walker's incredible clearance and Mo Salah hitting the post, probably could have walked away without penalties being needed. But again, I think fitness, the main thing they'll take from it. Yeah, I was um, in terms of anal- analysing the game, I think that uh, Manchester City, first half, was exactly what we expected. Popping the ball around beautifully, uh, through the lines from back to front. Uh, Rodrigo is going to be a, a, a very interesting signing for them this season. Um, of course, their big money signing. They've been more of a, a, an evolution at the Etihad rather than a revolution that will take place at Manchester City. We will come. We are going to preview every single one of the 20 Premier League clubs shortly. We've got our magic hat and uh, Hugo's hand. He's hovering, waiting to pick his beloved Arsenal uh, out of the hat. But Rodrigo, big physical presence. I think he's going to improve them massively. Six foot three. They need height. He'll be the tallest or the second tallest in the squad from set pieces. He could be absolutely crucial. And he really does control the game quite a lot 
like Busquets in his prime, if you like. Yeah, so I'm uh, on board with you there. He looked a little bit rusty yesterday, the first 20 minutes, when I think with my player's hat on. Um, it's very difficult when you've got players like, you know, David Silva and Kevin De Bruyne and Raheem Sterling all fizzing and moving. Gabriel Jesus in front of you. Uh, fullbacks like Zinchenko and Carl Walker bombing forward. To be in that role whereby you are the hub, you are the calm, sensible, let's get the game started kind of player. And he struggled for the first, the first 10, 15 minutes in that regard. He was looking around and his movement wasn't exceptional. But then he grew into the game and like you say... Uh, north of six foot, a sort of dominant holding midfielder, but that can get forward. You only think he's a, a huge step up. Um, in terms of Liverpool, I thought that second half they were very good. Spoke to Jurgen Klopp and Pep Guardiola after the game. Um, both obviously took, uh, took plenty of positives uh, out of it. But in terms of Liverpool in the first half, um, City dominated possession. And I thought that Liverpool basically were resorting to sort of longer balls into the channels, into the likes of Mo Salah. Firmino had chances and you thought, well, Mo Salah and Firmino are a bit ring rusty. But in the second half of the game, I have yet to see Manchester City in a friendly, in a competitive game, penned into their own half as much as they were yesterday. So um, let's give a little bit of a sort of out of 10. I say, uh, Liverpool for me, Eight out of ten in terms of a pre the last preseason run out ahead of uh, the opening game next Friday, Liverpool against Norwich. Um, give me your Manchester City uh, thoughts, please. Um, still the team to beat. Not only the team to beat, but I'm going to make an early prediction here. They're going to dominate the league yet again. Liverpool will fall short, especially given what we saw yesterday or especially after what I saw yesterday. I really do feel like City are in another level. And the fact that they're looking at strengthening even more by bringing in a right back Cancelo from Juventus, possible swap deal with Danilo being talked about, uh, some money going the other way. But that is going to mean that they almost have no weaknesses. I can imagine Otamendi being upgraded, but... I don't see anywhere else on the pitch where there is a Premier League player who Pep would rather have in the positions that he's got. Lots of people are suggesting, though, that Vinnie Company going off to Anderlecht as player-manager um, will have a significant leadership impact. But we are talking about a team that De Bruyne is a leader, albeit quiet. David Silva is a leader. Um, you've got Sergio Aguero that leads by example. Uh, John Stones, you know, he... he fell out of favour and then he came back strongly. So they're not lacking in leadership, are they? No, not at all. And I think they've all grown together and are now basically true winners. They know what it takes to get over the line. They're willing to put all the effort in. We've seen them go through the, the struggle, I guess, of repeating the Premier League domination that they had last time out. And they've done it successfully. I cannot see this going wrong. Honestly, I don't think there's any other Premier League that are within sight. Um, Pep Guardiola, I uh, asked him a question after the game. Uh, could one of the things, for example, um, that managers, uh, it, it's, it's almost called competition creep, calendar creep, is that we are now getting into 12 month of the year football. That has an impact on the mental state of players, it has uh, a physical impact on players. So I asked the question of both Jurgen Klopp and Pep Guardiola, is the season too long? Is there too much football? Are players getting enough rest? Here's Pep. Stand the man. How are you? I'm fine. Um, and you? I read, I read what Jurgen said and I support him every statement, every sentence he said about regarding about this, this situation. I know the show must go on and I'm not nothing optimistic about if they try to listen to the managers, the players about that. So that is not normal. So we well, put an example for the NBA, like playing incredible amount of games, but they have three, four, five months off. And that guy's finished, uh, uh, Riyad Mahrez had 10 days off. Mane cannot be here because he's 10. So, and one demanding. You go to the preseason and now you play against Bayern Munich and uh, Barcelona, Madrid, and you don't lose. The people start to say, ah, it's a disaster. He's going to, to the, you have to protect them. I know because the people say, ah, for the amount of money the players win, for the amount of money the... The managers win, you have to play, play and play. That is not normal. Stan Collymore. You're listening to The Last Word with Stan Collymore every single Monday through the season. We're going to be uh, dropping our fantastic new podcast. Thank you very, very, very much. Um, I feel very nervous. I feel very excited for the season ahead. 
Um, in the last two or three years, I've been doing more telly, more pitch side. Uh, so it's great to be back to be doing audio, radio, art, which is my passion, my love. Uh, what I grew up listening to, radio and painting a picture in your mind. We want to give you the very best in analysis. That's going to be the first 20, 30 minutes of every show. We want to be giving you a big interview. That's going to be Jurgen Klopp coming up. I went up to Melwood and had a chat with him. And I wanted to bring in young, hungry, fantastic voices uh, that I enjoy listening to. Hugh Wizzy joins me and uh, as the big sign-in so far. Our big Lukaku is going to hold it up. He's going to lay it off and I'm going to tap it in. You're not happy with the Lukaku? Well, he's been sold, isn't he? As if they don't want him. <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, all right. <laughs> our Nicholas Pepe. Yeah, I'll say that. I'll You'll take, take that. So you're getting very excited <laughs> on your YouTube channel. And uh, we're bringing in one of the big name signing um, before the transfer window closes. Um, but what we want to do is, is have a look at all 20 Premier League clubs. One of the big things uh, when I was doing TalkSport Radio is that callers to call Collymore or people tweeting him were saying, we only ever hear about the top six clubs. There's a reason why that is. They sell. They sell big time. So what we want to do is we've put the 20 names in a hat. We've got a minute or two to be able to go through all of them. And I promise you, whether you're a Norwich City season ticket holder, whether you're a Sheffield United season ticket holder or a fan from afar in the States or the Far East and you join us on the podcast, we will give you what you want. It's not just going to be talking about Manchester United. It's not just going to be talking about Liverpool, Chelsea and the top six. This is very much a pan Premier League show and uh, I'll put my neck on the line as a pundit every single week. I'll be giving it to you unfiltered and straight. So let's start the ball rolling. We have a very technological, <laughs> um, big operation outfit here in the heart of London. We've got machinery churning out like BT Sport, the script. Not quite. We've actually got a bit of gaffer tape, a roll of gaffer tape, and we've got 20 names uh, in there, which Hugo has just dipped into very gently. Death touch from the big man. Uh, give me the first name, please, Hugh Wizzy, and let's look at our first club in the 2019-20 Premier League season preview on the last word with Stan Collymore. And the club we start with is none other than Everton. Everton, the Toffees. Um, I've got them to finish, write this down if you're at home, ninth this season. Uh, Everton fans, when I put my table out on Twitter the other day, at Stan Collymore and at Hugh Wizzy, um, please do follow us, do join us, is that a lot of Toffees weren't happy with that ninth shout. Now... If we're looking at four clubs that are going to be tight, you say, well, it's going to be Chelsea, Spurs, Arsenal and Man United, isn't it, Stan? I think that tighter is going to be Wolves, it's going to be Leicester, it's going to be Everton and it's going to be either Watford or West Ham. I think that we'll come to Watford, but I think that for me, Watford last season would have finished uh, that 10th position instead of the Happy Hammers. Um, they were beaten 4-1 by them towards the end of the season, but they were uh, looking forward to an FA Cup final, of course, the Hornets. But let's concentrate on Everton, Hugh. Um, Fabian Delph, their major signing. If we have talked, and we do talk, about leadership lacking at other clubs. I'm looking at you, Arsenal. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you was like, oh, crikey, where's he come from? I've had my coffee. I'm shot out of a cannon this morning. Um, is if there's questions about leadership at Arsenal, um, does Fabian Delph do that for Everton? I think he's become Mr. Reliable. He's dependable. He's versatile. He can play in different positions. He's certainly had a resurgence in his career after the City, ga City move. Um, whatever Pep was doing with him has definitely worked. He's kind of fighting now, I guess, to get back in or to kind of secure an England for a position again. And you've got to admire his tenacity. Um, I two, think... big, two big dressing room figures gone, Phil Jagielka and Ashley Williams. Now, I know Ashley Williams didn't have a great time um, at Everton, but he still would have been a big voice in the dressing room. And Phil Jagielka going to Sheffield Wednesday, he was there for a long time. So he, he has to fill a leadership role for the Toffees. He does. And... I would say as well, Everton have been kind of splashing the cash. Obviously, Moshiri and Usmanov beginning to work together. It looks like their aspirations for being a Champions League club are within touching distance. Like you say, they're probably part of two or three that should be challenging for that 
top six or, you know, hopefully one day top four. And they have really shown their ambition with some signings, uh, the signing of defensive midfielder Gbamin from Mainz uh, to replace uh, the, uh, Gay. Idrissa was, Gay, who's gone to the PSG. Villa. There'll be plenty of up the Villa references. That's going to uh, be a... to PSG for £30 million, pounds, of course, Garner Gay. Another... Hard-working grafter. It's going to be huge to replace. Big shoes to fill. One of the best defensive midfielders in the Premier League, statistically only behind or kind of around Kante's level. And also the youngster from Juventus, striker Moise Keane, who they've brought in for £27.5 million. Pounds. Of course, a lot of people would have known him from getting racial abuse at Juventus yes. and the Chiellini kind of get on with it kind of thing. We'll come to all of the major issues of the uh, uh, of the sport during the season. Well, a lot sure of people saying that, that up. he could well end up being the next Lukaku, that they have the potential to sell him on for a huge fee in a few years and Manchester United will probably be there to pick up the pieces. OK, the last word uh, always uh, comes to me on Everton. Uh, Gomez, Richarlson, key. Uh, goal scoring for Everton. Everton has been a major problem in terms of 20, 25 goal season strikers since Romelu Lukaku, of course, uh, left to go. My verdict, the Toffees, ninth. Next team, please, oh, Hugh. Ninth, that was harsh. Okay, next up, we have yeah, Aston Villa. Up the Villa, up the Babbies. Come on, you've missed come on, haven't you? Be honest out there. You've missed that every single... I, I love it, I get... So, this show is going to be very much about me and telling me how great I am as a broadcaster <laughs> and all of these things. I knew you um, uh, <clears throat> very much me, 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 me. But beyond me, 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 me is Aston Villa Football Club. Now, let me start with this, you haters out there. I can see you on Twitter with your Fulham badges turned into claret and blue, your avatar. I've seen it. From Baggies fans, Wolves fans, Mind the Gap, you name it. Now, professional pundit in me says 13 players is a gamble, is a risk, a bridge too far. Why? Because in a dressing room, it is football law, L-O-R-E, that you bring in two or three every season and you get rid of two or three every season. Evolution, not revolution. So, of course, Fulham broke the mould. Wolves brought in a lot of players last season as well. Nobody brings up Wolves when they bring in a lot of players. Finished seventh. Although a lot of their players, to be fair, were brought in. Their key players, like Neves, were brought in the championship. But they didn't bring in Rui Patricio and Jeremy Moutinho and, and top quality players. Villa are aspiring to be where Wolves are this season. But they lost players like Tammy Abraham. They've got rid of some of the old Deadwood, like Glenn Whelan and Micah Richards. Uh, they've turned loans into signings like Tyrone Mings. And I am telling you, take this to the bank. You remember a man that came from Belgian football, nobody would ever heard of, called Christian Benteke. Came into Villa, did well, went to Liverpool, not so well. Crystal Palace, so-so. Wesley, the Brazilian up top, is the real deal. Jack Grealish has beefed up and he will want to now be a Premier League player. Um, Yotta, they've brought in um, Tyron Mings at the back, brought in a new goalkeeper, an England goalkeeper, Tom Heaton. Hugh, you, you're nodding and you're agreeing with me, I think, maybe, <laughs> looking at me a little bit strange there. I think Aston Villa will be safe and I'm going for Aston Villa. 12th is the summit of their ambition, which I'm going to be positive. Uh, the, if it all goes uh, belly up, course relegation or bottom of the table is 13 players too many Hugh Wizzy it's a very big call isn't it because you've got so much to gel so much that needs to happen so quickly how are they going to work together what's communication going to be like the thing that I think really works for Villa is the history is the fan base is the fact that there is so much positivity around and expectation. the club getting back it's not Fulham with a great huge, I've played for Fulham on loan I've played for Villa there's more expectation on Villa they should be in the Premier League that is where they belong even last season, I watched when Steve Bruce came, he's really transformed the fortunes. It looked like they were going to be kind of languishing around mid-table. They weren't very exciting. Under They've Steve picked Bruce up there, steam. Actually. They've spent a huge amount of money, smashed the transfer record, I think, twice, Mings and Wesley as well. I've got to say, I do think that they'll stay up, if only because there are quite a few players in there who are experienced enough, not only in championship dog battles, but also ones who want to take their career to the next level. Right, that's Aston Villa. I'm going for 12th up the Babbies, up the Villa. Uh, b b get the, uh, the, the Wheel of Fortune going again, please. Here we you. go. Okay, next up we have Sheffield United. Sheffield United, the Blades. Um, a, a little mini statet for you here. 
Uh, out of all the clubs in the Premier League, uh, you know, we're talking about 90s and 2000s, Sheffield United is the only big club ground that I've never played at, Bramall Lane. One of the oldest in the country, but I've never ever played there. I've never actually even been in the ground this season. Uh, not this season, ever. So uh, this season, uh, Chris Wilder, uh, given a new three-year contract, a fantastic manager, and I'll come to his strengths very shortly, is that Sheffield United, um, I'm coming for you this season. I'm coming up to watch you. Um, I want to be an honorary blade. It's the only big club I've not been to. Second in the championship last season behind uh, the Canaries. Where are you? Let's be having you. We're going to come to Delia's men uh, and uh, women very shortly. Shrewd signings. Callum Robinson. Big prospect to Aston Villa. Um, wasn't getting in the team in the sort of dark days of just before relegation. Uh, so he went to Preston. Flew there. Uh, Lise Moussin, uh, another prospect from Bournemouth. They're buying players, shrewdly thinking that, OK, we'll break our transfer record. We've got Premier League budget. But if we go down, we can and will be prepared for the championship. And the big one for me, and I want to have a chat to you about this. Um, every stereotype, every cliche has come around this player. Last chance saloon, Ravel. Morrison. Morrison. Indeed. Uh, for me, it's a really exciting signing, if only because we know how talented he is. The potential has always been there. But he's, he's, it, this is it, isn't it? I mean, I was told in my career towards the very end, Collymore, Last Chance Saloon, Leicester City, Bradford City. He hasn't even had half the career that I had and mine was disappointing. So he's got to do something now. Clearly, but what I would say is that you know how the way that people look at like Jaden Sancho, Adamola Lookman, players that aren't they're really afraid. They're doing it, right? They're doing they're it, doing it, mate. But, the, but the, <laughs> let's not put Ravel Rom uh, Morrison into into he was an, Sh Sancho land. He was he was basically an early getter in that he wasn't afraid to move outside of the country, outside of the Premier League, to be able to take that next step. Yes, things weren't working out, but he wasn't afraid to go out of his comfort zone. And for me, that's something that really could play into his favour here. Very shortly, um, we'll be looking at the other, what, we've got 15 clubs left in our Premier League preview, but uh, I want your thoughts on Sheffield United. Stay up or go down? Um, unfortunately, I think they're going to go down. I've got 20th rock bottom for me. Oh. Just uh, Spirit, Graft, great manager uh, that's got a three-year contract uh, in Chris Wilder. Just not enough quality. Fighting Spirit in the Premier League is very rarely a recipe alone to stay up. Okay, next up out of the hat, we've got Leicester City. Leicester City, the Foxes. Um, this is going to be uh, happy days, I think, if I'm right. I've got them down to finish eighth. Um, again, uh, let's put this in the context of Wolverhampton Wanderers, Leicester City, Everton, West Ham and Watford are going to have a cigarette paper between them this season, if I'm right in my calculations, um, similar to last season. I like Brendan Rodgers as a coach. I've got a little story for you. I went down when he was coach at uh, Swansea. I had a really good chat to him about his philosophy. Uh, we kept in touch. Um, very, very good at wanting to get the best out of young players. He told me, I said to him, Brendan, when it's the carrot or the stick approach, as a young lad, I used to get the stick. Collymore, you've got this ability. We're going to hit you with this stick and make you better. He said, it doesn't work, Stan. You've got to give the carrot. And I think that with players like Damari Gray, Harvey Barnes, James Madison, he's going to give them the belief to take the step up. If they step up, Leicester City are going to be much, much better for it. The flip side to that is, is the old guard, the miracle men of Wes Morgan and Jamie Vardy and Mark Albrighton. I think he's put his arm around them as well and said to them, you're still very important to me, which I think Claude Puel had a problem with. He wanted revolution, not evolution. I'm going for the Foxes to finish eighth. I'm also going to give them here you go. On the table. Absolute nap for the League Cup or the FA Cup. Oh, I like Free the sound thought. of that, if anything, because I do admire the way that Brendan Rodgers has come back and been able to give Leicester a new identity. Their style of play is quite clear. They play an, an, a nice, attacking, attractive And they've got the players to do it. Vardy's going to hurt you up top. Yep. Madison, Barnes, Gray, have probably, talent and ability. Probably, to me, got the most balanced midfield in the Premier League, barring maybe Manchester City. Madison... You got Ndidi, uh, you got the youngster coming through Chowdhury, mm. and uh, who else have we got in the middle? God, there? I'm getting so juicy on your knowledge. I in, like it. In, in all honesty, the youngster who came from Monaco, Yuri Tielemans, he's a player that I've been watching since about 15, and 
he can pick a post. It's ridiculous. And perhaps the shows majority... that Leicester City now is a destination club, not you're going through to go somewhere else. At Taylor. least they've got aspirations to be. And I think the way that they're selling themselves to people, now that they've got the history of winning the Premier League under their belt, it's certainly a more attractive proposition to Right, place. how many clubs have we got through there? Count your little bits of paper. I think we've done four. We've done four clubs. We're on to Let's team go. number five now. Let's rattle through a few in, uh, in quick order. Newcastle United. Newcastle United, the Geordies, Steve Bruce. Um, this is what you're going to hear week in and week out. I'll write a column for the Mirror. We're actually recording from the Mirror headquarters today. Um, and my column starts uh, again today. So you'll be able to get my mirror column later on this evening and also my Sunday people column on a Sunday. Shameless plug from the Collymore. <laughs> um, what you're going to hear is every time he loses a game is you, Mac and Bar Stewart. Um, and that's what happens. When you've got an association with a former club, particularly he stuck his neck out for Sunderland, perhaps not thinking he was going to get the Newcastle job someday, that's going to hurt him. Um, there's uh, behind the scenes, there's potential like Arsenal. Are they going to boycott? Are the Geordies going to stay out of the stadium? Geordies, by the way, I am 100% behind you until our big club supporters say enough is enough whether it be on transparent information, whether it be a malaise or a poor owner like Mike Ashley, it's not going to end. We're just going to keep on getting poor ownership, but we'll come to that at some stage. They've lost Rafa Benitez, Iosi Perez to Leicester. We missed him out as well in Leicester. Uh, Solomon Rondon. Um, Joel Linton's come in, and also Alan Sam Maxim, a wide man. Um, they have to hit the ground running for Newcastle United, and I dare suggest to you that they've got to win games at home and win plenty of them for Steve Bruce to not be under pressure. Joe Linton, £40 million signing, a transfer record for a club who don't want to spend money. It's, it's very important, I think, that we stress that the people who were behind the protests, behind the, you know, get Mike Ashley out or Stan Kroenke out. Are they right or are, wrong? Because you're a big gooner. You want action. I just want to stress that it's not simply about transfers. It is about transparency. It is about giving fans... Information. Information, better ticketing options, problem, um... cheaper prices. There is a lot more to this than just splashing the cash on a striker. So I have heard people come out and say, oh, Manchester United are going to spend 80 million on Maguire. Well, why are you complaining about the Glazers? Well, if if you look into it, the Glazers have taken a £750 million loan out of the Green club. Green gold They've campaign. paid about £45 million of it. under for about a decade or so now. Right. And the direction that they are going in is certainly questionable. Nothing's changed at Newcastle, despite the fact that they've spent £65, £70 million already. I would say one more thing. They've brought in a guy on loan, Jetro Williams from um, Eintracht Frankfurt. Quality from the left-hand side. Um, I am expecting Newcastle to do a little bit better, actually, than last season. Yes, I've got them down as 15th. I've not got them relegated. So that's Joel Linton down the middle. You've got Alan Sam Maxime down the uh, right-hand side. And Jetro Tull, that's a, a, a Jetro. band for the dads, <laughs> uh, back in the 70s, uh, down the left. So the Geordies may well have it right, but Steve Bruce has to hit the ground running. We are uh, previewing all of the 20 Premier League clubs on The Last Word with Stan Collymore. Um, genuinely, again, we, we went to number one in the sports charts on podcast before even recording today. We're all a little bit nervous. We're like, whoa, we've got to deliver. And now we've just gone, the news has come through from our erstwhile producer Chris that we're number one in the overall podcast charts is that the aim is simple we talk like fans we are fans we get big name guests on and hopefully unfiltered opinion still has a place in football rather than saying it was a game of two half stand it was great and what have you Hugh Wizzy's joining me as my first big money signing we've got one more to come in through the door before Romelo Lukaku uh, goes off to uh, Inter Milan I guarantee you but we're a little nearly a third of the way through our uh, Premier League preview uh, next one from our uh, little ball of, uh, of, of joy next uh, up we've got Burnley Burnley interesting last season um, had the Europa League and traditionally, Chelsea, Manchester United, Arsenal, clubs with huge resources can cope with the Europa League. It was proven last year. Your club, Arsenal, get into the final. Chelsea get into the final and win it. Manchester United have won it in recent seasons. But I've seen Stoke City. I've seen Swansea City. I've seen Birmingham City. And I've seen Burnley 
fascinating one when we come to Wolves this season because I genuinely think that they can be one of the mid-sized clubs that break the mould, but that's Wolves shortly, is that Burnley's problem last season didn't have the squad to be able to uh, attack on all fronts, and it massively hurt them early on. Um, big season for Jay Rodriguez, comes back to his hometown club. We all were disappointed because this was a guy that we saw early on in his career, and you think he's big, he's strong, he's mobile, he scores goals. Horrific injury. Um, then goes to West Brom that have torrid problems on and off the pitch. Um, so it's a big one for him. And I, I saw the other day, I was looking at some of the local Lancashire papers. Sean Dyche likes 4-4-2. The rumours are now that it's going to be Chris Wood, straight down the middle, New Zealand Kiwi, all white, holds it up. J-Rod one side of him, Ashley Barnes the other. Um, need to improve at home. Uh, only seven wins. Will that change to a 4-3-3, make Burnley a little bit more of a formidable outfit at home where they need to get points. I always worry when you start talking about expansive football with teams that are used to being... Pragmatic. You know, yeah. Uh, I looked at Fulham last year. Yes, they spent a lot of money. Yes, there were some exciting names. And the attacking style of football they were trying to play was great to watch, but ultimately they didn't have a hopeless clue. It was, it was awful watching them trying to defend. And we saw it come apart very quickly. I've got more faith in Burnley. They've got a manager who is steadfast in what he believes in. And I can't, Been there seven years now. Is it, is it seven years? A little too bit much. too long for him. Is he still, is he still got the, the, the ears of the dressing room? I think he's massively underrated, actually. He should be one of the most highly thought of managers in the country. He's definitely someone that if you know, we had not moved away from the identity that England as a nation had, I would have been happy to see him go in. I also would have been happy with Sam Allardyce though, so I don't know how you feel about that. Oh, disgusting. <laughs> uh, I've gone for 16th Burnley, a little bit of woe, but enough to stay in the Premier League. Next one, please. I want to rattle through in double quick time now, two or three. Okay, We're chasing right. our tail. Uh, it's not a three hour show anymore like I used to have. I've got an hour, so I've got to do it. Staying with Claret, we've got West Ham next. West Ham United, Matty Lawless of the Mirrors, uh, the of digital sport just sat in the corner there and he's a massive uh, West Ham United fan uh, B Westwood uh, Bianca Westwood's going to be joining us as one of our guests on the show in the next couple of weeks as well and she's a, a massive hammer as well um, firstly West Ham fans I told you so this is smug Collie Moore remember I did a column in the mirror Arnautovic not a player to build the club around you gave me pelters all of you you said he tracks back. West Ham actually put a video of him tracking back once <laughs> as kind of proof that he was this hard-working behemoth. Um, West Ham United are a big club that have moved into a stadium and want forward travel. But I think, unlike Wolves that in the Championship had a chance to grow a team and a club at a similar speed, I think that almost West Ham are, 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 are way too big for where they feel that they should be right now. And that should be... Our aim is to stay up. Our aim is to add uh, quality uh, young talent to the group, to add to the likes of, uh, of Declan Rice, who's been exceptional. Disappointed that they lost Reese Oxford this week. He's gone off to Germany, I think. Uh, promising young player. Didn't quite happen for him. I remember him breaking on the scene um, at the bowling ground. I think it was against Man United. And then everybody was talking about him as a potential um, huge player of the future. It was Didn't almost definitely against Arsenal. We have a habit of was it? giving people careers. Okay. Yeah. So for West Ham United, for me, it's, it's, it's fairly simple. Where should they be aiming? They should be aiming to break into the group that probably will contain um, Wolves, Leicester and Everton. Um, so Arnautovic is out of the door and they were right to get him out of the door. I think that Sullivan and Gold looked at him and thought, we need a talisman, we need a big name, we need a presence. But he was rotten in the dressing room. And West Ham fans didn't believe me, so I was right. He's gone, he's off to China. Um, where are my worries? Diop, Fredericks, Balbuena, Creswell, Winston Reid and Ogbonna. I'm not convinced those are the kind of players. Aaron Creswell was sensational several years ago. Bombing forward, again, he was the next big thing. Um, but in pre-season, I've seen a couple of the games. Not convinced with them as a back four unit. But again, I get bombarded with, with uh, West Ham fans, like I do Arsenal fans, saying, we've bought great attacking players. We have already got a, a great attacking players. We've got, you know, Philippe Anderson. You know, Jack Wilsh has had a good pre-season. Declan Rice will go on and get better, uh, centre-half or defensive midfielder. But I look at their back four and I'm not convinced. So I've gone for 11th. Um, they were 10th last year. They beat uh, Watford 
Last game of the season, Watford won eye on the FA Cup where they got mullered, of course, by uh, Manchester City. But I think progress for West Ham would be, let's not talk about Sullivan and gold and stadiums and issues and problems. Let's have a season whereby they become a difficult team to play against. Um, and I think that if they do that, they can progress. If they start shouting from the rooftops early season, if they get a couple of results, then I think, again, it, it will be a mildly disappointing season for West Ham. One to watch, though, for sure. I think they're going to break into that, um, that little group that you were talking about. Watford, Leicester, uh, Everton. I can see West Ham getting there. All there right, we agree to dif disagree. Next club, please. Right, next out of the hat, we've got Manchester City. Manchester City, the champions of England. Well, what can we say? Firstly, um, they were very good yesterday in the Community Shield. We've already gone across that, giving you the tail of the tape and the stats. Um... Rodrigo, we've already gone into how good he was on his debut. Uh, huge name players to come back, of course, like Sergio Aguero. But they have lost their talisman and their captain, their leader, their legend, Vinnie Company. Uh, League Cup winners, League winners, FA Cup winners. Listen to this, fans of every other Premier League club. This is sobering. 17 games, they scored more than three. Seven games, they scored more than four. 20 clean sheets. Um, I'm struggling to look at any club other than Liverpool that can put in a challenge. But Liverpool, for me, again, lots of people will say, seven draws, Stan. Liverpool, they only need to turn one of those to over... But 97 points, Liverpool looked at their max. City look as if they've got another gear to go into. I think they have as well. And the improvement that they're going to be making by not only Rodri, I guess, anchoring in the middle, but also the possibility of the new right back from Juventus, Cancelo, who's as good, if not better, than Walker. Fantastic delivery. The fact that Jesus really is just coming into his own and is, I think is ready to uh, step into Aguero's shoes, if you like. And that they've got just a plethora of world-class talent sitting on the bench. Mares barely played. 60 or 65 million pound signing that could walk into most teams in world football. I just don't think this is ever going to stop right now until really they either stop investing or Pep gets off. Will they win the Champions League this season? A yes or no answer? I'm going to go no again, unfortunately. Okay, let's go to the next club. Uh, let's keep it moving on. All right, next the up. The spinning wheel of... Punditry. <laughs> Next up is Norwich City. Norwich City, that means... A message for the best football supporters in the world. We need a 12 man here. Where are you? Where are you? Let's be having you. Yes, Delia, let's be having you. The Canaries back in the Premier League, back in the big time. And uh, I'm delighted. Why am I delighted? First, I like to see... Um, new, young, fresh coaching meat come into the game. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, Sam Allardyce a little bit earlier, but you, we know the name. Sam Allardyce, Tony Pulis, the phone rings. It's November, it's December. Come and rescue our club. Come and keep our club in the top division. So it's nice that they went to Daniel Fark and said, right, slash the wage bill, get rid of the dead wood uh, and see where you can go. And they were 14th in his first season, the championship. They got rid of every name. They bring in unknowns. Uh, Arnel Hernandez scored eight goals last season. Mario Vranic, 10 goals last season. Jordan Rhodes, the archetypal stereotype. He can do it in the championship, but he can't do it any higher than that. Being around the block at a number of championship clubs. And then Timo Pukki couldn't hit a cow's arse with a banjo at Celtic. So they sweep all before them. Scoring goals for fun, as I've mentioned there. Um... But the cautionary tale is, and I've got them to finish 19th, that's second from bottom, and Norwich fans on Twitter were like, oh, call him a lazy punditry, Sheffield United bottom, Norwich City second from bottom. Listen to this. They conceded 57 goals. That's one less than Birmingham and five more than Stoke. Stoke finished 16th and Birmingham finished 17th. If you go into the Premier League with such a reckless team attitude to defending, you are going to get mullered. In the first two or three games, you might be able to play your pretty patterns and everything's fine. But eventually, it's going to wear in confidence. 
This team cannot stay up, can they? It's exactly the same as what happened with Fulham last year for me. They play very expansive attacking style of play and as a result, they're going to get caught out. One thing I would say in their favour is that they've got a lot of young, very talented defenders coming through the ranks. Max, Max Aarons. Max Aarons. Fullback. Ben Godfrey, Jamal Lewis, all coming through the ranks, rising stars. And I love this kid, Patrick Roberts, who they've got on loan from Manchester City. Sam Byram in from West Ham, 750 grand, their only major signing. I mean, when you're looking at Villa spending 100 million, and Norwich spending 750,000. You've seen the very weird nature of how coming up from the championship can either open the purse strings or... or there, there is also the history that Norwich have got in recent times of being in financial dire straits yes. and having to switch things around. They've become a very well-run club. Everything is coming Stephen in-house. Fry, Delia Smith pies. I think a lot of people are feeling quite positive about coming back into Where the Where are they going to finish? I'm going to say that, <laughs> OK, I'm going to go 17th. I think they're going to avoid the drop. Hugh Wizzy is call. now it's a, a celebrity <laughs> in Norwich. He's grown a sixth finger as Listen, we speak. I, I, I'm slightly biased because I've got some family in Norfolk. Right? Oh, good but lad. Right, Norwich City, he's got them to stay up. In 17th, I've got them to go down. Next club, please. OK, next. Give it a good shake. Give it, give, it just, give, it, no, give it a good shake. <laughs> we have got... Tottenham Hotspur. Tottenham, Tottenham. Wow, no one it? can stop them. <laughs> Ooh, We're going to do it like we did last year. Ooh, well. Not quite in <laughs> Madrid. Matty's laughing. He's a West Ham fan in the corner. And you're laughing because you're a gooner. Because right. I love seeing them fall short. Um, Again, another club for me that I really like because um, my mom, it's her birthday today. Happy birthday, mom. She's 89 today. I'm going up to Canada to see you later. She used to work at Canuck Swimming Baths. This has no relevance to the podcast whatsoever. <laughs> but she, before fantasy football began, my mum's a big football fan, is that I remember going into the staff room and the guy that was the, the main swimming instructor said, right, we've all got to write down our favourite players. And, I and she wrote down, from, and I kid you not, from number one to 11, Glenn Hoddle in every <laughs> single position. So, Mom, that one's for you. So, I've always had a bit of a soft spot for Spurs. When Aston Villa won the European Cup in 1982, we had Lecoq sportive kit. Spurs had that lily white Lecoq sportive kit and I had Lecoq sportive boots as a, uh, as a kid as well. So, I've got a soft spot for them. Stable club, stable team. In Ndombele, they've brought a player that they need. Not the... I want to say something fest, it begins with W, that Manchester United have the fetishism of big names. They don't fall into it. Why? Sold Gareth Bale, 90 million on the nose. They, they broke their transfer record six times in, in a week, seemingly, bringing uh, in the likes of Nasser Chadley and Paulinho and Soldado. Didn't work. Daniel Levy's gone back and gone, we ain't doing it this way, we're doing it my way now. Poch is a bit frustrated, and I want to come to that. But Tottenham Hotspur will, for me, be in the top um, three. I think they'll be the best of the rest. Champions League runners-up. Um, I cannot see them going on and making a title tilt, but I can see them just having that evolution of ticking along. And in and Dombele, I think that a signing for a club that needs that type of player, hand in glove. Now, as a gooner, give me your straight down the middle opinion on Spurs. Okay, right. First things first, un, on Ndombele, fantastic signing. One of the midfielders that I really would have loved to see at Arsenal. Apparently, he's come from, in 2016, playing in the reserves, amateur football, in fact. His rise has been like super fast almost sort of mirrors and Galo Kante sort of playing in it really does leagues in French football it really does and I think he is quite a versatile player he's not going to be a Kante style um, he's able to pick a pass he's got a trick or two he could play in a nice little pivot with winks I can see it being a massive improvement on what they've got so far and it, I think he really does give them a shout with at least staying in the race with City and Liverpool for just a little bit longer so that means you have them to finish above your beloved Arsenal? No, I think they'll drop short right at the end, as per usual, and uh, probably fourth, fifth. The yeah. only thing I would say to watch Spurs fans is this kind of little narkiness about uh, Maurizio Pochettino. Through last season, towards the end, short one-word answers, looked a little bit prickly when asked about transfer budgets, running the club, taking the club onto the next level. That one may run and run. Next club, please. Okay, right. Next up, we have got... 
Bournemouth. Bournemouth, AFC Bournemouth. Uh, the most annoying club in the Premier League for me. Uh, and, and I say that not as uh, not a fan of, uh, of uh, the manager, who is exceptional. Um, they have got, uh, in Eddie Howe, a man that has a vision of how the game should be played, playing through the lines. Arsenal light, I'm going to say. But if they're Arsenal light, and Arsenal have, have been traditionally been Barcelona light, then it gets lighter and lighter along the way. Now, Bournemouth should have no expectations, realistically, of doing anything significant in the Premier League. They've got a ground that holds 11,000. It's very difficult to get players down there. Um, 14th last season, I'm going to have them around the same area. I'm actually going to give them a position more, 13th. But um, positives. Philip Billing and uh, Lloyd Kelly from uh, Huddersfield and Bristol City, again, proof positive that they like to get players in and develop them rather than what they did a couple of years ago, where they did break their transfer record a couple of times to bring in players. It didn't quite work for them. Tyron Mings, of course, has left um, Bournemouth to go to Aston Villa, £20 million in the bank. Um, Callum Wilson, recently in the England squad, um, looking forward to him, and Josh King, who, he doesn't, not many football fans share this with me, but he's one of my favourite players. Was at Man United, Norwegian, young lad, goes to Bournemouth, and I've seen him, and Bournemouth tend to play very well against the bigger teams. Um, and I've had results against the likes of Arsenal and Manchester United in recent seasons. Um, but he's big, he's strong, he has a fantastic touch, his movement and his cleverness as a centre forward is very good. So I'm looking forward this season. Um, King is now 27, he's not a baby anymore. Callum Wilson's just signed a, a, a new long-term deal. I think that Bournemouth could legitimately be the best of the rest and, and, and avoid big time a, a relegation scrap I don't see them anywhere near relegation but I want to see more from them yeah I've got a little soft, soft spot for Bournemouth uh, I lived there about 10 years ago when I think they were in League 2 just had a 17 point deduction and Eddie Howe has done just unbelievable can things can he do it anywhere in. else I'm not going to lie I think they're kind of at the end of it I think it may well have gone as far as it's going to go right now. However, I'm a big fan of Callum Wilson and King up top. Ryan Fraser was the most creative player in the league last year, at least in assists. And Aki looks like he's growing in terms of experience, stature, and he looks to be a one who big clubs could come in for even in the remainder of the window. So no relegation for you? No, not at all. Not all right, all. let's go to the next club. Halfway point on the uh, last uh, word. It's a longer show. It's a bit more breathy because... The action doesn't start till next week. We'll be across everything, starting with Liverpool against Norwich on Friday. I'm going up to interview Jamie Carragher. Going to have a fascinating sit-down with a, a man that was uh, my former teammate when I was at the end of my Liverpool career. He was coming in. Tomorrow I'm going up north to have a chat with Macclesfield manager Sol Campbell, a, a, a legend in one half of North London and a pariah almost in another. Uh, one of the only black managers in the league and I know he's very vocal about that. Um, Gary Neville uh, coming up. Michael Owen, he's just uh, texted me yesterday. He's in Portugal, probably playing golf but um, he's got a new book coming out so I want to have a sit down and have a chat with him particularly about this kind of quite incredible trilogy of clubs he's played for arguably the three biggest supporting clubs in the world Liverpool, Man United and Real Madrid Manchester United the next one at the hat Manchester United now I'm going to go into these for a little while longer than the, the permitted time my producer's like panicking he's like we've got to turn this <laughs> shit into an hour somehow uh, first show, we let it breathe a little bit longer. Like I say, when we've got football matches, we can go bang, 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 bang. Managers getting sacked. We have to give our opinion on where we think clubs are going to finish. Where do I think Manchester United, the self-styled biggest club in the world, glory, glory, Manchester United, welcome to Old Trafford, the theatre of dreams, sixth. That's Ooh. your lot, Manchester United. Why? <laughs> Champions League quarter-finalists last year. Ollie's at the wheel. Everybody's excited to see him. Everybody. Um, even anti-Manchester United fans are like, I, like, I can't not like this guy. He's, he, he wrote his history large in Premier League and Champions League history. Um, he's come from uh, Mulder, a young coach getting an opportunity. I like it. Ollie's on the bus. We're all on it to a greater or lesser degree. And then the crash happens. And I th actually thought, and I wrote about it last uh, year in, in, in my mirror column, I thought he'd get the sack. I thought that actually Ed Woodward would be so daft to go, it's been that bad that we're going to go to, we're going to go, you know, balls out for, for, for Pochettino. They didn't, they stuck with him. But this is a football club that quite simply has lost its mojo. It's lost what made it Manchester United Football Club. And for the youngsters out there, 
Google the Busby Babes. Google the philosophy of having an academy talent or prospect on the bench at the very least during the match day squad since 1937. 1937. Not Diabala, not Mandzukic, Juventus' sloppy seconds. I'm talking about a club that won trophies and had a philosophy of young players, of course the odd two or three marquee players, Solid, stable organisation structure, and they ripped it up. Why? Because like Liverpool at the end of the 80s, going into the 90s, is that they thought they were omnipotent, they thought that the recipe was right, and every other club, particularly the noisy neighbours, Manchester City went, we're going to employ uh, Soriano. Beguristein. We're going to have a structure. We're going to have a philosophy. We're not. We, yes, we're going to spend big, but we're not going to be. We're not going to be spending. You know, Pep Guardiola got it right the other day. They're not spending three hundred million every budget. United. Oh, let's let's buy Harry Maguire. Not for seven million four or five years ago as a good transfer strategy. Let's buy him because he was top man for England uh, last year. Uh, his agent, Paul Stretford, who was my agent as a player, will ramp the price up. Stretford's a big Man United fan as well, so he'd want his client to go to uh, Old Trafford. 80 million. You're looking around and you're thinking, how does that tally with Wan Bissaka? Young, promising. Daniel James, young, promising. But still having this fetish, fetishistic, um, galactico um, oriented model that Ed Woodward is a fan of. Now, for me, Ollie should stay. They should give youth a chance, but Ed Woodward should get the sack from the Glazers. But I think, just like at Arsenal, we've got Silent Stan and a few of the others, that Woodward basically takes all the crap to allow the Glazers to go on and do what you want. Sixth in the Premier League, again, for Manchester United, nowhere near a title tilt. Discuss. I mean, I can't believe where you're coming from with that, if I'm honest, because it's... Just common knowledge that they needed a centre-back. Harry Maguire obviously is expensive and apart from the World Cup, what has he really We're done? We're talking about long-term planning, Hugh. We're talking about me, not having to buy 80 million. We're talking about giving Axel Twanzebe, mm. who was at Aston Villa, main billing and saying we're going to stick him alongside Eric Bailly. I know Eric Bailly is injured or what have you, but by two young centre-halves. But when it, that goes wrong after three or four games no and people guarantee. start panicking... Harry Maguire is a very good, solid centre-half, but there's nothing that he's done in his career that su could suggest to me that he's going to be the next Bruce or Pallister. None. £80 million, pounds, which still isn't pocket change, chump change at the mm. bottom of the sofa. That's a significant outlay for Manchester United. He's got a, they've got to get it right with him. Okay, from day one. Okay, but in their defence, they clearly need a centre-back. Mourinho has been telling them that since he, before he left. They don't seem to have, you know, a clear direction on, or a, a possibility even of bringing in like a Koulibaly or whatever it is. So it is back to the Premier League and spending more money. So you remember that he is going to be more than delit. So it's not about the fact that he is going to be a world-class immediate, you know, fix all the problems. But these are the prices, the inflated prices you have to play in the pay in the Premier League do you think they're going to be a success I've got them down as six where do you think they're going to be very briefly and then pick, start picking out the next the you next know um, it's very difficult to call because there's still some time in the transfer window I think um, Paul Pogba was just the subject of a £27 million bid plus James Rodriguez from Real Madrid so if there is movement in what I would consider to be their most important player yeah they're going to suffer um, that said, I think that Maguire is actually going to improve them. Just they, passed his medical, just got it uh, hot off the presses. Sarri Maguire passes Manchester United medical, so that's going to happen. Inter Milan to make new Lukaku bid. You know, you, you're talking about um, it being a problem and Galactico type of mentality, but in their defence, they've also spent money on a Daniel James, on a wan -Bissaka, who are young. Where they're they going to finish? Gonna, Shaw, where are they going to finish? I'm going to have them... Fourth or fifth? Fourth or fifth. Get, let's get the next name out. Okay, right. Let's do it. Let's do it. No like messing around like your positivity. here. Straight into Southampton. Southampton. Um, another strange club to be able to analyse. Um, I've got them 17th in the Premier League this season and I've got a lot of stick again on social media from Southampton fans saying Ralph Hassenhuttle, like Daniel Fark, the job he did in the Championship. Um, get rid of a, a, a lot of the Deadwood, uh, ending the days of them being um, uh, Southampton pool, you know, players going left, right and centre, Virgil van Dijk, Lallana, all these players, Danny Ings going up to, um, to Merseyside and then basically, from Southampton perspective, selling to anybody uh, their bright young thing. 
the new one, of course, not so much new because he's got a few games under his belt now, is James ward Prowse. Vitally important for them this season. Um, but I'm looking at their... Still, Charlie Austin is on the, on the payroll. They're looking to get rich. Still, Shane Long, in his 65th season in the Premier League, is on the, the payroll. Danny Ings, 8 to 10 goals maximum. I don't think he's going to get the 25 goals. Che Adams is the one for me. Coming from Birmingham City, it's on my patch. Um, again, excellent running in behind. Uh, apparently, he's been very good for Southampton in pre-season. He's one to watch. But if they are struggling, which I'm predicting that they will, um, I could see James ward prowse being a sort of hostile target for them in the next uh, window, which then unravels a lot of things. I take on board Ralph Hassenhutl, his high-octane, very fit approach. But again, looking at the quality of the team, I don't see enough goals, I don't see enough wins, and I see that as trouble for Southampton. Yeah, I think personally mid, mid-table mid would be a real result. I think they're going to struggle for that as well. Uh, che Adams, exciting, but like you said, I think they're kind of dependent on the likes of Redmond. If he doesn't have a top season, they're really going to struggle, and I can see them being involved in a dogfight. Yep, next one. Okay, right. You're listening to The Last Word podcast. It's our, uh, well, basically, we've got an opportunity. We're five days away from the start of the season. Liverpool, of course, open up the Premier League campaign uh, against Norwich City. And uh, Manchester City, the current champions of England, go down to uh, the London Stadium and West Ham United. Uh, Spurs, they play uh, my beloved Aston Villa. Um, Let's have a little look here. Bournemouth, they host Sheffield United. Burnley host Southampton, who we've just talked about in the preview. Crystal Palace will come to them. We haven't hit them yet. A lot of woe at the moment around Sellers Park. They face the Toffees of Everton. Watford against Brighton. I'm expecting good things from uh, the Hornets. And uh, as I mentioned, Spurs face Aston Villa. Villa back in the big time for the first time in three years. We're doing our roundup uh, preview of every Premier League club. We hope you're enjoying it. Um, we are going to have so much fun this season. Jurgen Klopp interview, I hope you enjoyed. We've got Carragher, we've got Neville, we've got... Bianca Westwood, the the nation's heroine on Sky Sports uh, every single week. Big West Ham fan. Henry Winter, the uh, chief football writer of the Times, gave us a fantastic insight of being at public school, coming through that route, of course, the origins of the game. Barry Fry, my former manager at Southend United, tells some uh, old tales. So we've got some very big name interviews uh, coming up over the next few weeks. But it's punditry, it's analysis, it's a sideways look at the game. We've got the news with Hugh, we've got um, that taking a sideways look at the uh, the lighter side and sometimes the darker side of the beautiful game. Uh, but the next club, please, Hugh, pick it out. The apple of my eye, the bane of my life, it's Arsenal. Arsenal. Utu, Utu B, Utu B, A, Guna. Uh, they sing. Um, right, I'll have my say. Fifth is where I think they're going to finish. Oh. I think they're going to miss out on the Champions League positions. They were fifth last season. So it's another season of um, plateauing. I had my summer holiday this year. I went to Crete for a, a week and I spoke to a couple of, there's a lot, obviously Greece, Cyprus, Turkey, a lot of huge amount of gooners. And they were in despair and they were like, what do we do? Do we protest? Don't we protest? But I love the club and I go over from, from Crete three or four times a season and should I not go now? Um, the, the background at Arsenal Football Club that, that I will defer to you is febrile at the minute. Tell us the latest what's going on amongst the Arsenal faithful as to what to do to the, the, the lack of information, the lack of... Um, uh, openness, the lack of transparency, the lack of ambition mm. at Arsenal Football Club. There's been some big changes, obviously, last season. We saw the new manager come in. We've now got a director of football in Edu. Um, there is, you know, Raul Sanelli. We've got Vinay coming on, Venkatesh. We've got a lot of new faces, some accountants, some guys who are doing the contracts. Um, but the main thing, I guess, is that we are beginning to have some kind of dialogue. And that has been missing for the last 10, 11 years, I think, since Kroenke got involved. Um, there was a response from his son who's come over to kind of oversee things and oversee the changes at the club. And he told the fans to be excited. And since we have had well, the signing of Nicolas Pepe. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Mm-hmm. You've just broke your club transfer record. Yep. 72 yep. large, 72.8 <laughs> large on the nose for Nicolas Pepe to, to partner Auburn and Lacazette. What are you moaning for? 
Okay, well, um, first things first, I'm not moaning about that signing, especially. It is our transfer record. You can never be upset about that. However, we need defenders, Stan. Um, and that was what was most evident in the friendly that we saw yesterday. Barcelona winning 2-1, coming from behind after Arsenal made a good start. And we saw all the things that are kind of synonymous with Arsenal. Xhaka spreading it wide with these passes, but also being liability Loved in the middle. Martinelli and Saka, two youngsters on the right and the left. Yeah, some potential Exciting there. play. Perhaps more importantly, Ozil looks to be picking up some form and up for it again. He picked out Aubameyang with a beautiful crossfield ball and Aubameyang smashed it home from 25 yards. Top goal scorer. If anything, a lot of people wanted him sold to fund a Zaha move. I would actually say that we should be making sure that we use our strength in Aubameyang up front and Lacazette should probably be sitting behind. Let's be perfectly honest though. As a club, as a team, they've got the spine of jellyfish, haven't they? If you're looking at... If you're looking at Vincent Company, John Terry, Yap Stam, oh. Rio Ferdinand, oh. <laughs> uh, Virgil van Dijk, real characterful men in a dressing room. So what you're saying is they're you. men's men, they're leaders. But well, hold on a, a second. Men's men, women's women, hold it doesn't matter. Right. Leadership on the pitch is still a fundamental right. thing to have that, that Arsenal indeed. do not have and haven't invested no, no, in for no. a decade a or more. I'm going to cut you short there, Stan, right? Where's I'm, the leaders? I'm going to show you the leaders. I know you saw Meza Ozil getting chased through If you're going to say to me that Meza no, Ozil is a leader, no, no, hold there's on, hold the on, door, hear me out. there's the A1. <laughs> He's only just signed me. He's trying to throw me out Drink the Drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> Meza Ozil, a leader. Okay, hear what I'm saying, man. Meza Ozil got chased through Golders Green recently. Right? He had to drive off in his car, fearing for his life. I think they were trying to get his nice watch. Nice G-Wagon, by the way. It is a beautiful car, right? 100 grand, apparently. And he was... Um, Chased, luckily, whilst he was about his mate, Sayed Kolasinac, who, as far as I'm concerned, is the spine that Arsenal need, or at least is part of. Him and Granit Xhaka are two guys who come from a very similar background. They've grown up in and around war-torn countries. That's all they fantastic, history, saving your teammate. And mate, they can stand up for each other on the pitch. I'll give you another example. It's not necessarily just off the pitch, where I was incredibly impressed with Kolasinac's bravery where he stood up to a guy who had a meat cleaver coming at him. Yeah, but the guy on the meat guys. cleaver isn't going to waltz past him wearing night vaporons at no, 300 miles an hour and saw, stick it in the top corner stop his left hand bin at the Emirates at the end of the season. We saw at the Emirates, Jesse Lingard and Rashford, both up for, and equally up for a challenge, thinking they were the hard men on the pitch. And they met Granit Xhaka and Kolasinac and were put firmly where in their Where are they going to finish this season? Top four. If he doesn't get top four, I'd like to see Unai Emery replaced. <sighs> Crikey, straight in with a replacement shout. Next team, please. Crystal Palace next. Crystal Palace. Um, now, this is a very interesting one. They lose Aaron Wan-Bissaka, uh, £50 million to Manchester United. Can get ploughed straight back into the team, you would hope. Steve Parrish, I know very well. Um, and he's coming under a little bit of stick, as owners do, as managers do. Uh, will Wilfred Zaha go? Uh, we'll come to a great little story in the news with Hugh um, at the end of the show about Wilfred Zaha playing uh, footy in the garden with his dad, a great little uh, uh, snapshot into, into family life and football life. Ten goals last season. If he goes, you're taking ten goals out of the team. Um, can Andros Townsend step up? Always a player that I've enjoyed uh, at his best. You think of him picking the ball up, going past a couple of players, rifling it into the top corner for club or country at his very best. But can he step up? They only won five home games last season. So they could be going into a new season, having had a crap pre-season, Season, losing Will Zahar, losing one Basaka bombing down the right hand side doesn't look very good at all. But they won nine away games. And this is where the beauties of football analysis all start swirling around my head. And I'm thinking, very poor at home, but they won away at Leicester, at Manchester City, at Arsenal, at Burnley, at Wolves. So you're thinking to yourself, if they can bottle that. And I would imagine it would be counter-attacking football uh, at Crystal Palace that does that. Pace, uh, defending their own half of the pitch, nick the ball, Zahar, Wan-Bissaka, uh, other players uh, going forward and nicking the odd point here and there. Three points away from home. There's one player I want to point to. Jason Punchin has gone. With, uh, 
We don't just give this player is coming and that player's gone. We look at the potential impact on the dressing room. A big player for Crystal Palace in recent years. He's a local boy. He's moved on now. That's another voice, a big voice taken out of that dressing room. What are, what are our analysis and thoughts on Crystal Palace? I've got them down to be 14th, but it to be not a particularly enjoyable season for the Eagles. I think it's going to be a really difficult one. I think they'll be involved in the dogfight again. Like you're saying, most of the time I think they'll sit back. They scored a really amazing goal last year playing under the, the press against Liverpool. And I think the Zaha down the wing has been so crucial that if something is to happen late on, perhaps an Everton move or somewhere else, that it's really going to hit them where it hurts. Next club, please. Let's keep moving it on. We're on the, uh, the last leg of pre-season ahead of the restart of the Premier League. Very, very exciting. My first column for the Mirror comes out later on today as well. Back on Monday duties with the fallout in column form. So you'll have the podcast listening to my beautiful Canet dulcet tones and you'll be able to uh, read uh, my latest thoughts on the Mirror every Monday. And of course, the Sunday people every Sunday when you wake up, you're scratching your backside, you've had a night out, you want some sense in this beautiful game to cut through the dross. I will deliver. Next club, please, Hugh. Right, one I know you're excited about, Wolverhampton Wanderers. Wolverhampton Wanderers, the pride of the black country. I started there as a, uh, a young apprentice and uh, scored plenty of goals in the uh, youth team. It was at a time when they were at rock bottom. Steve Ball, Andy Much, fourth division, 50 goals a season. Um, they're a big club for the younger audience. In the 1950s, for three years, they were Manchester United. They were the Manchester City of, of now. They played the first game under floodlights at Molyneux. Um, the first golden boy of English football, Billy Wright. First centurion was from Wolverhampton Wanderers. So a big club with a lot of history and tradition. But let's very much get to uh, the present day. Um, last season, they were awesome against the top six. Why? Wolverhampton Wanderers and Nuno Espirito Santo... Uh, his f philosophy is simple. You sit back, you have a great shape, you shift left to right. They've got some very good defenders, players like Co uh, Connor Cody, Bolly, uh, Doherty, one of the fullbacks bombing forward. You nick the ball and then you give it to your key men. Uh, Ruben Neves, there was a steal coming from Porto, captain of their Champions League winning, uh, ca ch captain of their Champions League campaign uh, in his last season at Porto as a young boy. Goes to Wolves in the Championship, one of George Mendes's men. Um, and then they added to that last season, Rui Patricio, European champion. Uh, Jean Moutinho, European champion. Uh, Yotta. Um, they've got some incredibly talented players, but Huddersfield beat them twice. Um, so does that mean they have the mentality only for big games? The expectation now is going to ramp up a level. They're in uh, the Europa League. I've already again put in my uh, mirror column last week. I think that Wolves could go all the way and if not win the Europa League, they could get into the, the, uh, the last four, which I think would be fantastic. I think that some of the smaller and bigger clubs in, in Europe will underestimate them. But what does that mean for their Premier League campaign? I've got them down as seventh. We've already talked about Watford, West Ham, Everton and Leicester chasing them. Can they maintain or go even better, Hugh? I think it's going to be slightly more difficult this year because everyone knows how they set up. They'll probably have to try being slightly more attacking. And I think that's what they're thinking. We have got the defensive stability there. 46 goals conceded last season. They've brought in Coutrone from AC Milan. Patrick Coutrone, yes. yes. Young, 21-I-think-year-old uh, striker who I'm sure a lot of people in Italy have been raving about for quite some time, but he will be new to a lot of faces um, or Premier League fans. He's someone that I would keep an eye on. I'm not sure that they're going to be as good as last season, if I'm honest, um, if only because they're going to have to come at teams a little bit more. But uh, I do like Santo, so he's, to me, one of the best managers in the league, or at least one of the most um, exciting Pick out the next one. Raul Jimenez up front, of course, next as well, up, the Mexican. Got... And uh, hold on, uh, Adama Triore, a word on him. Went from Barcelona, uh, goes to Aston Villa, speed merchant, goes to Middlesbrough under Tony Pulis, does very well. Uh, they broke their club, tra uh, club uh, transfer record, Wolves. I think he was about £16 million. But he's an impact sub. And I think that Wolves this season, in the, with the purchase of Cutrone, are looking at somebody that they can bring on that has more of an impact in, in knitting players together. If, uh, if so he could, as good as they are, not been convinced at all by Adama Trey. If he could sort his final ball out, he would be one of the most incredible oh, players in the world. Oh, he's pace. He's Usain Bolt with a ball at his feet. But Goes past people with for Usain fun. Ball at a, uh, uh, with a ball at his feet. He was useless. I mean, there's loads of players with pace. 
uh, Theo Walcott had loads of pace. You know that oh, more than anything on. else, but Walcott's, final delivery. Walcott's anyway. got an incredible record, Go mate. On. Let's not Next club. <laughs> Next club. Another one that you play for, Liverpool. Liverpool, the champions of Europe for the sixth time. Um, still looking for a top-level title. And, of course, that was sung yesterday to them gleefully by Manchester uh, City fans. Um it's not going to be a title this year. I think that what we saw last year was um, acknowledgement, all of us with our hands up saying Manchester City are an incredible team and they have another gear to go into. Do Liverpool, having not brought in... I mean, the only way for me that Liverpool were going to almost guarantee to say, right, they're gonna, they can go toe-to-toe with City and be confident of going past them if they would have brought in a, a Messi or Ronaldo at their very best. I think that was that was what it was going to take. Um, a world-class midfielder that is at the top of their game at their very best. Because I look at it, Virgil van Dijk, how much better can this guy go? Um, Alison Becker, clean sheets for club and country. Um, Mane, Salah, Firmino, scoring goals, creating chances, dovetailing well. A great season for Jordan Henderson, a great season for James Milner, a great season for Gini Wijnaldum and Fabinho. Cater was a little bit disappointing. But I just think they are much better than what's below them, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. But I still think that Manchester City will be the team to beat this season. Is there anybody that could come in and make significant inroads into the team? I'd like to see Divo Carigi put... Um, Bobby Firmino uh, under threat of his place. I think there were times that Firmino wasn't great last season. And I know that Origi started the, cha- uh, the charity shield from the left, but I'd like to see him given a go down the middle with, uh, with Mane and Salah either side of him. And it'll be an interesting one. And you tell me about this, lad, because you'll have seen him as much as anybody. Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain. Come to Liverpool, had a nasty injury. Liverpool use him for most of their social media stuff because he's a nice guy and he comes across very well. Does he have the ability, the ability now, to go on and give Liverpool even something more than they had last season? He's another option and they have got plenty of options in midfield. But one thing that you stress there is that I don't think they've got one of these elite guys and I don't think Ox will ever be that elite guy. I actually think Arsenal did very well to get £40 million out of him. However... Um, he is on the road back. He's one of these confidence players. You can see he's chirpy as anything, good banter and whatnot. So I'm sure he's popular in the dressing room. He's definitely got the potential to secure an England spot for me. So, you know, future's bright for Ox, especially being involved in such a successful side. You're listening to The Last Word with Stan Collymore, the UK's number one podcast, not just in sport, but across the board. Delighted that we've had your support, and I'm delighted to have the support of CT1, which is the UK's number one sealant and adhesive. You know what I hate most about conventional sealants? The smell. I had my bathroom done a couple of years ago, stunk the place out. I said, not again. Windows open, couldn't sleep, hay fever the lot. That solvent smell. Well, CT1 with its technology has removed that. Did you know it's the only sealant and adhesive in the world to be awarded a Norwegian? That's Norwegian. Those people do it properly up there in the fjords. Uh, Norwegian asthma and allergy certificate, making it the healthiest and most user-friendly sealant in your home. CT1 doesn't contain any of those solvents or other nasties. And indeed, it's not only good for your health, but also for your home, reducing triggers of asthma attacks and preventing allergies in the home. CT1 has been voted the number one sealant and adhesive in the UK many times. One of those reasons being it reduces the car and footprint. We like that a lot. Being the snag list eliminator and lasting up to 25 years. So use CT1 in your home or on the job you're working on. The last word. We are two thirds of the way through our uh, Premier League preview. We're going through every one of the clubs. That's what we're going to do this season. We're going to give your club, if you're a blade, if you're a villain, if you are a hornet, this is the place to come every single week. We're going to give it unfiltered with the biggest names, the biggest guests, and they don't come much bigger than our first guest on the first pod. He breezed into English football with a big toothy smile. De Meister from Borussia Dortmund, where he had the fans eating out of his hand, likewise at Liverpool. He's cemented himself now into the pantheon of greats like Bill Shankly and Bob Paisley and Kenny Dalglish. I went up to Liverpool, I went to the training ground Melwood and I sat down and had a chat with the one and only Jurgen Klopp. 
Jürgen, I'm delighted that you've joined me. Last word with Stan Collymore. Um, a fantastic end to last season. Um, for, for our listeners, what is the key to preparation for any new season, and particular, particularly when you've won arguably the biggest trophy of them all? We could end all that prom because we have never won the biggest trophy. <laughs> um, I, won, uh, yeah, it, it, I don't see it as a massive challenge. It, it depends, of course, to the, to the character mentality and mentality of the, of the players of the team. So if I would guess uh, or imagine that they can't stop flying in a, in a not so good way, then, then I yeah, then had, have to intervene. But, um, this team is not like this. This is um, I, it's the other way around. I really think um, that this team is rather now. Okay, it was a big relief for me because of losing a couple of final stuff like that. And but it was a, um, for sure a big relief for a, a lot of players, especially the players who are longer here. That everybody mm. is facing constantly the questions, the, the the comparisons with the with the big ones in the past and stuff like that. But it's only one information. The other information is what you get. We were really good last season. We played a fantastic season and it was not a coincidence. Nobody thought it was a coincidence. Everybody saw that we improved, that um, there was a lot of hard work in it. And, um, so, and I, this team will invest again a lot. But that doesn't mean that we then will be better than last season. It only means um, there's no difference between the season before, the seasons before, and, and uh, if you think about the preseason. So, if there are no differences in the way that you approach trophies, you want to, I would imagine, with the season ahead, want to approach everything. You know, you want to be as successful as you can. What are the key ingredients for you as a manager that you want to see, in, particularly in preseason, from your group of players? Look, the preseason is nowadays a, re a big challenge because the players coming back in completely different points. When I was a player, we came on the first of July, six and weeks everybody was back. As, yeah, everybody was back. Six weeks preseason, fantastic. We could work. We had ups and downs, ups and downs, and we trained so hard you couldn't, can't believe it. Or well, you can't believe, but um, people out there not. And um, so that's now one challenge. So we have to we have to do the physical work. There's no doubt about that. On the other hand side, we have to. We have, we, there were still um, um, things we have to improve. Proof, of course, fluency, um, defending parts, uh, finishing parts, and creating chances and stuff like that. But uh, then it, there's, there are parts where we were really good, and I'm not sure the football team can. In moments you can do it better, but in general you cannot do it really better. Like we defend it in different moments, but then we have to do it again. And that's football is not like riding a bike; so you lose it over a mm -hmm. summer, <laughs> unfortunately. So you have to bring all these pieces together again. It's like. The, the, the main thing or the message is not resting on the last season, no, no building on it. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it's not our, it was not our final destination. It, um, that's how we felt it 100%. But of course, we need to be ready again. And the preseason will be like a preseason is. So putting a finger in the things we were not good, using the things we were good and all that stuff. Do a lot, work a lot, enjoy training, enjoy the physical work as well, because you know what, why you're doing it for it and why you're doing it. And last year, the best example was then, of course, that winning at the last day of the whole season, the biggest final in, in world football, apart from the World Cup, obviously, um, and still being able to do it, it's only because of the preseason. And um, so that's why the boys are, how is that? They came with a smile to train. I saw, I saw some of the instruments yeah, yesterday, yeah, high yeah. five in Virgil and yeah. Endo back. Um, what are your aims this season? Without being specific, because we could say, well, you want to retain the Champions League, you want to win the Premier League, which you're going to get asked a million times. But again, what are the general aims? Is it improvement? Is it yeah. seeing players develop? Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. are the, what are the major aims but for that's it. But that's it. Playing the best football we can play, and that means that we have to we have to have to improve individually and as a team. And that's possible. So my example is always I, I really feel that James Milner made big steps. <laughs> that sounds not great since we are work together, but not because I'm in. But he made big steps with this team. Really, in his, he was always a fantastic player. But how it's all coming together, like in the right moment, all his skills, what he always had. Does that give you more satisfaction because he's a senior pro? In other words, you can teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. The reputation of, of, yeah. of developing younger players. But does it give you satisfaction that James Milner? has kicked on as a footballer. For me, I, I, I personally didn't have 
I didn't need that pr to prove that. I knew it before, but probably not all not all personalities can do that. But Millie was open for everything, and so it's such a wonderful professional. But it's only one example, and then you have, we have all the other players. They have so much space to improve, and improvement is always it's not learning a new mm -hmm. trick. It's it's like bringing consistency in mm -hmm. the things you do. You have to start if you. Shape always drops from time to time. It's a wonderful moment, less of a wonderful moment, and all that stuff. But these these bounces you have to control, and mm -hmm. that, that you know it's not like whoop, what happened today, yeah? and and stuff. Like you shouldn't be surprised that you are good or surprised that today is you are not good and stuff like that. So that's all a part of a, a personal development and improvement, and that's what what we are working on. And there are, we have more players than eleven, eh? so means so there, there will be internal challenges, fights for positions, not always because most of the time the guys who are fit play uh, because of the number of mm -hmm. games, but uh, there are games where everybody wants to play but not everybody can play and then dealing with that is another challenge, so there are a lot of challenges coming up, I'm looking forward to it, but no season is like the other season, and the last one was wonderful and we will, because of the last match, uh, last game of the season, we will remember it forever. At on plus we had 97 points in the league. How did we come there? Because everybody took his role like he took the role. Not that he was asking for more game time or whatever. They accepted it. I watched training. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I stand next to the door. Open it, but the boys have to go through. Mm. And sometimes it was easy for them and sometimes it was not that easy. But everybody was ready in the moment when he was needed. And that was, a, was unbelievable to them. Philosophy. Everybody talk. Everybody now has to have a philosophy of of of, of playing, um, which is a fairly modern phenomenon. And um, I went to Mainz last year. It might have been earlier last year, talking to Leon Balogun, that's now at Brighton. Um, and every, I wanted to talk to people behind the scenes. What was Jurgen Klopp like? What, and it, the, the 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 key words were, um, which mirror a lot of yours: support, family. Uh, creating something where everybody was happy and you could, that was a tangible feeling. Mainz is a relatively small club. You then go to Dortmund, you create a family environment, a feeling of everybody is a part of this. You then come to one of the world's biggest football clubs and you do the same. When I look at people's philosophies, a manager goes into the dressing room, here is my philosophy, and then he's a different person outside of the dressing room. Your football philosophy just seems to be an extension of who you are as a person. How do you manage that <laughs> in one of the most ruthless industries on the planet? I have no idea. <laughs> To be 100% honest, it sounds like I'm a really selfish person because I've, I'm, I always create an atmosphere I like. <laughs> um, ah, I, I've really no idea. And, and thank God, I, I've had only three clubs. And I remember when Mike Gordon asked me, what's your philosophy and stuff like that in, in our first talk. And I said, Mike, if you would explain me now four hours baseball, I still wouldn't have a clue. So why I should explain to American my football philosophy? <laughs> Uh, he got the joke. But the key um, word, support, uh, empathy is a word that I've, yeah, I've yeah, watched yeah. a lot of your interviews and the words are the same. Empathise. If I can't do something, somebody else will help me to get to the answer. Is that those are all just common sense ideas. That isn't a specific, I want to play this way. Oh, yeah, yeah. And oh, human yeah, beings seem to respond to you. No, I have an idea of how... I want to play football, and again, that's selfish because I, I want to play the football I like to see. Yeah, <laughs> and then um, and I have a, an idea about how I want um, to yeah, come along with people, treat people, stuff like that. Easy. Let's really be be nice as often as you can. It's how life should be. Why right? we should meet each other and constantly are close to have an argument. There's no reason for Is that. Is that not difficult in, in in a sport and in an industry though that 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 does have anger, that does have violence, that does have spite? It's part of the industry, and you seem to kind of like always be above that. You're always smiling above that. <laughs> I'm not always smiling, but I, I cannot take it too serious. So the thing is, the outside world, there may, may be like this. But when we close the doors here at Melwood, then we can be like we want. So and then we go out, yes, and we play football games, nothing else. So we ha don't have to be part of all these little fights. And sometimes out of from emotion, I, even I say something about another manager or another club or stuff like that. It makes not too much sense, but it happens because we have to face so many. We are normal people and we, we, sometimes we, we feel the tension of the situation, sometimes not. 
But that's all. We are just we are just normal people, who are a bit better in football like that, uh, like others. That that's all. And um, we we are fortunate enough that we really um, work for a club like Liverpool. I ever, always understood it like this. When I was a player, it was easy for me to accept that I was only part of the team because I was only part of the team. I was never the star of the player. I always I, I was lovely to play with all these other guys, and they became better and better and better. And I stayed on the same average level. So uh, from from being kind of supportive to not disturbing at the end of my career, I, be I became the new role as a manager overnight. And for me, it was a paradise because now I could be part of this football team without disturbing with my football skills. It was fantastic. And, and I, really, I really loved it from the first second. And that's how now is it. I, I love having these boys around, having these boys around and, and seeing all the skills they have and, and, and doing my job to, yeah, to make the most of it. That's how my, 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 my job was always, even when I was a player, because I was only on the right flank or up front and, and, and couldn't really help, apart from a few things I was quite good in. Only a couple more questions. It's fascinating. Thank you for your, for your candour. That's, that's the kind of thing we want our listeners to, to be able to get from, from, from key people like you. Football is now 24-7. The demands are greater than ever. How do you relax? Better and better and better. It was very difficult in the beginning. Very, very difficult. Uh, young manager, very busy, very, very busy. Uh, we had lesser games, obviously, because we never played um, European. It was completely different, actually, job to do. But I watched, I think, I, I, I always, I get this question asked sometimes, and I think about it, and the number in my mind differs, but it's, I think it's between five and 10,000 games without being involved in them, only to learn the game, to understand what happens, different systems, all that stuff from all over the world. I had never time to, to, to make a trainee program with um, um, another manager because I was immediately in the job and never, never left the job pretty much. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, what, um, that's how it started. Meanwhile, the things I did 20 years ago by myself, I have now around about 25 people for. So I have time to relax from time so you delegate to time. better. Oh, much more, much more. It's completely different. Yeah? So it's completely different. And I love that a lot. But holiday was now four weeks. Um, Did you relax? Very, very often. My wife thinks that's not true because when I get up, I, 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 I read football and stuff like that, but I'm not involved. It's like, I, I read it like a football supporter. So it's like, wow, they really buy him um, and stuff like that. So I, I read the transfer rumors and stuff like that. And the funny thing with that is if you're involved, so if somebody tells any, says anything about Liverpool, you think, oh, come on, nil point nil. But it's about United or City, you think, oh, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you're, you're a fan. <laughs> a clear Which I'm is fantastic, fan, uh, and that's yeah. obvious. Um, <laughs> one piece of advice you would give to an aspiring young manager? Uh, yeah, really, learn football. Because it's, it's not so difficult. We don't talk about rocket science, mm. but um, to, the, the, only, the only thing that really can happen if you're a good guy, and uh, to do a training session, I don't say it's easy, but it's not. You can learn that, but the rest, the, the game understanding and stuff, really, you have to. Nobody can tell you. You have to do it by yourself. So I did it with watching thousands of games, and but that's what you actually have to do because there are so many questions from the players coming, and you have to convince them. If you sell your idea like a kind of or a maybe or a probably you will lose the game in a second, uh, the, the team in a second. So you have to bring the players behind you. That's only possible with, with all the answers um, that you can give all the answers a, a player um, could ask for. And um, yeah, that's the job to do, learn football. Finally, what are the hopes and aspirations for the 2019-2020 season ahead? What kind of, what? what, what aspirations, kind? what do you hope for? Oh, the best season we ever played. That's the plan. Actually, I even know it's been there but because of the plan every year, but it is the plan because there's always space. And um, it can be more points, it's difficult, but be more successful, it's difficult as well, but possible, so we should try it. Or at least doing the same again, stuff like that, having incredible games, really creating memories again for the rest of your life. We had that again, it's a Barcelona game. If we wouldn't have won a Champions League, okay, but not exactly the same memory, but still in 20 years to look back and think, wow, that game was really special. Creating moments like this um, for all of us, that's the, that's the aim and um, that's what we are going for. Jürgen, you're looking tanned, you're looking healthy, <laughs> you're looking ready. Thank I you very much. I hope beyond hope that you have a great <laughs> and successful season. Thank yeah. you for joining me. See you at Villa. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> 
The Last Word with Stan Collimore. Fantastic chat there with Jurgen Klopp. Hopefully, from my perspective as a former Liverpool employee, the Red Men can go one better in the Premier League. But Pep Guardiola and a very formidable team stands in their way. If you want to see the full interview, you can. You just uh, go onto YouTube and type in the last word with Stan Collymore. The whole video interview is there as well. With our big set piece interviews, we'll make sure you'll be able to see them as well as hear them to get that extra feel. So uh, that's Jurgen Klopp. Thank you very much, De Meister. See you during the season, hopefully, lifting a little bit more silverware. Now we are two-thirds of the way through. Three teams left in our Premier League preview. Who's next? Brighton and Hove Albion. Brighton and Hove Albion. Get rid of, uh, uh, well, one of the uh, only black managers uh, in the league. That doesn't mean he should be, um, uh, shouldn't be sacked if he wasn't doing the job. But I thought he was, again, evolution, progression. Uh, but they've gone to Graham Potter, that is very highly thought of uh, from Swansea City. Um, Adam Webster, defender, £20 million from Bristol City. Cardiff won more games last season, went down. Um, and where are the goals going to come from for me? Um, Glenn Murray, still a stal- stalwart, 13 last season. Shane Duffy, five goals. And Downey, three goals. Um, they only scored more than one goal last season, eight times, which is, I guess, why they've employed, employed a new manager to bring in, to be more open, more attacking. That's certainly what Swansea City were under Graham Potter. But I've got them to be relegated. I'm looking around at other clubs and I thought Southampton have got to be in with the shout of getting uh, relegated. Will Palace be there or thereabouts? Maybe yes. Villa, of course, we just don't know. I've just guessed the higher end of their expectations, which would see them 12th if I'm right. But Brighton and Hove Albion, could this be the season after a couple of seasons staying in the Premier League that they go back from whence they came? I'm not going to lie, I think it might well be. However, there are a couple of names that I'd like to mention uh, from last season who really did impress. The guy at left-back, Bernardo, Brazilian, definitely got the potential to play for a bigger club, no offence. Um, Trossard, who they've just brought in, a lot of potential from Genk. Genk got an incredible history of bringing players like De Bruyne and Didi, uh, Benteke, Wesley. Wesley. Uh, we got, uh, wait, is he from Bruges? Uh, anyhow, we've got uh, Locadia as well. So... If they are all not, that firing, doesn't screen, that doesn't scream guaranteed quality for a relegation scrap. To all me. right, let me give you an Izquierdo. How about that? I think still he's, doesn't. No? Next. All right. Well, they've sold knockout, so I don't really know where it's coming from. I like from Leon Valligan, the central defender, Nigerian, Super okay. Eagle, came from Mainz last season, so it's his first full season. Uh, no, second full season, central defender. If Lewis Dunk goes, That's he may thing. well slot, in, slot Dunk into that. Is Dunk going to be replacing Maguire? They're talking about possibly some movement there. So I think that uncertainty going into the season isn't going to help them. And and they may well be involved in the relegation battle. OK, 18th, I've got them to go down. Let's keep moving very quickly. We're in the last three. Next or up, last we've got couple. Watford. Watford, the Hornets. I like what they do. I love what they've done with their stadium uh, in recent seasons. I remember playing there for Leicester City and tearing my hamstring uh, for Nottingham Forest. So my debut for Leicester City was there. I hit the uh, crossbar with the header or the pose with the header. And a few seasons before that, I tore my hamstring very badly for Nottingham Forest on a pudding of a pitch and an awful stadium. But now the flags are out, the banners are out, uh, ownership that seems to be really into the business of football, keeping players and managers on their toes. And uh, a club, again, leadership tends to be at the very high end of... uh, very good punditry and analysis, but not amongst fans. Fans look at names. Give me a name. Diabala, Mandzukic, Pogba, Lukaku, uh, Mane, Salah, De Bruyne. But in a dressing room environment, Hugh, the one thing I would say is if you've got somebody that is the glue that sticks together players, that is a good conduit between the dressing room and the assistant coach and the coach and the higher echelons of the club, you have a chance. And I think in Troy Deeney, He is the most underrated leader um, at any football club. And I would put him in, in terms of pound for pound, what he's given in terms of leadership to a club, the equal of John Terry at Chelsea, uh, the equal of Vinnie Company at Manchester City. Look, not the trophies that he's won. He'd just come off the back of a gubbin in a cup final. But a player in a dressing room that people listen to, that he will tear a strip off, that he'll put his arm around, that he'll help settle in the area. Watford have had a big turnover of players and they've still managed to be competitive. And I know for a fact that Troy Deeney has been a part of that. 
welcoming people, showing people, you know, the schools, that all of those things matter. So for me, Watford have got top 10. I think that they would have been top 10 last season. They got done by West Ham 4-1, I think, on the final game of the season. But they were switched off. I remember playing for Liverpool in 1996. We were playing the, the FA Cup final against Manchester United. The famous Cantona goal, 1-0. Uh, at Wembley and we played Arsenal a week before at uh, Highbury and nobody wanted to get hurt. Nobody wanted to go into a challenge. So I think that if Watford would have finished the season without a cup final, I think they would have comfortably not only been 10th, but maybe uh, even higher. Players that I'm looking forward to, Craig Dawson, they brought in from the Baggies. Again, another player with leadership quality, a big voice in the dressing room. Um, Troy Dini, I've mentioned, Andre Gray, uh, Akaka, uh, Isaac Success, De La Feo. It, between them, you've got physical strength, mental strength, technique, width, creativity. So I think that Watford are, are on course again for another good season. I'm going to have them top half again. If anything, I think they could push for that seventh spot around Leicester and Wolves. I think it'll be very similar again. I love the balance that they've got in midfield, um, whether it's Ducore, Will Hughes, Kapue. Does he need a big season? Will Hughes, uh, again, spoken in, in, in passing dispatches in the last three, four, five years of being a player that could go on and be a, a, a midfield English superstar. I think he's right on the cusp, really, as far as creativity now, goes. Madison, certainly in the conversation, but he should be there or thereabouts. And with Ducore and Kapu, that kind of... It's a, it's a brick wall, really. I really do feel like they'll be in that contention for that six, seven. How many spot. have we got left? Producer, two, one. Let's have We've a little got look. We've got one left. We've it's got one left. London club, transfer ban, Chelsea. Chelsea, a fascinating club to end uh, our look at the twenty Premier League clubs. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's our very first uh, last word with Stan Collymore. It's not going to be. Uh, quite so manic because we're going to be re reacting to developing stories on a Monday to come. We're going to have the big name guest interviews. But we did want to, as our first show, say, right, we're five days away from a season. It would be remiss of us to miss out Brighton, Sheffield. You know, I'm sick of it. I hate it. I hate the fact that we are now, and I understand why, because Man United sells, Liverpool sells, Chelsea sells, Arsenal sells. But we're very much a pan-Premier League, pan-football. We're going to go into the Championship. We're going to talk, be talking north of the border uh, with guests and with our uh, analysis. Hugh is also as well. He's just come in. He's a little bit shy. Uh, if you go and look at his YouTube videos, he raps, <laughs> he sings, he dances, and uh, he's not afraid Don't to uh, share an opinion. That, he's our first big money signing uh, here on The Last Word with Stan Collymore. We're going to have plenty of names batting things around. Um, but primarily, it's me, I'm back, and I'm delighted to be sharing my opinion with you. So let's go to Chelsea Football Club. We've had some great legends down the years. Ron Chopper, Harris, Osgood is good. John Terry, Didier Drogba. The names trip off the, tr the tongue, not mine even. Uh, but if there's one player that perhaps stands out and could certainly stake a claim for being uh, Chelsea's greatest ever player, it's their greatest ever goal scorer, Frank Lampard. I was at Wembley with my daughter. I was bubbling, gobbling, crying, greeting like a, a child when that final whistle uh, went uh, when Aston Villa beat Derby County in the Championship playoff final. And the rumours, of course, even before then were, will he go, won't he go if Chelsea come in for him? He's gone. Uh, and he took Jody Morris with him. Um, my opinion is this. Nobody's expecting Chelsea to win the title. They've got the Europa League trophy on the ca on, in the cabinet from last year. Yes, Eden Hazard's gone, but if you look at the... I just looked at the, the attacking talent, Hugh, yesterday. Pedro has had a good pre-season. Olivier Giroud's still there, holds a, a line leader, a genuine line leader. Willian's still there. I'm sure he would react positively to, to Frank Lampard and Jody Morris. Michy Bashwi, he's a player that needs to look deep within his soul and say, am I a standout Premier League central defender? And one that I've just put... Dot, 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 dot after his name, Tammy Abraham. Did it in the championship last season for Villa. For me, a little bit green, a little bit lightweight. But this, despite the transfer ban, Hugh, this isn't a poor team. This is a good team, a good squad, a club legend coming back with a sound, solid voice. Um, I've got Chelsea to finish fourth this season. Let's not forget, Tottenham obviously went and got the Champions League final runners-up, had a good Premier League season without spending any money themselves. I think it's possible for Chelsea to be there or thereabouts again in the conversation for Champions League football. Obviously, they've won the Europa League, so 
it's great that there are going to be so many young English prospects getting an opportunity this year and they're going to be working under I don't know, you will know more than I do, but he strikes me as one of the most intelligent, hard-working people in the game, Lampard. He obviously understands it. I was taught when I was younger, head movement is key to being a midfielder, knowing what's around you the whole it's time. It's always like being an owl. It's kind of like, I've you know, never an owl's head move their head on so its much. axis. You just keep looking around. What's coming? Uh, what's happening three or four, four potential moves ahead? And don't forget, this was a guy that, as a player, wasn't the most technically gifted um, he was a, in an era that he was being compared day in, day out with Steven Gerrard, another great midfielder, and also the likes of Paul Scholes. And he still rode through and broke records as he went. The key one for me is a little feisty sod. Um, he's cocky, sometimes borders on overconfidence, Jody Morris. He will bowl in there. It's his club. Uh, you look at his Twitter feed and his, the, the, his pinned tweet is, you know, a young boy that lived the dream for his local club. He will be working left, right, centre, 24-7, to work with players that, of course, he did now as seniors in some uh, respects when he was with the under-18s, under-21s and the under-age groups. I think Chelsea will finish fourth. Where do you think they'll finish? Yeah, I've got top four. Oh, actually, no, do you know what? I'm going to say fifth. I'm going to say fifth. I think there's one area where they lack, and that is up top. Olivier Giroud, to me, is in the twilight. It's, it's, good, for, it's good for 15 Premier League, 15 to 20 Premier League goals a season. He's also good for a 15-game goal drought. All right. Uh, well, there you go. Thus sp speaks Aguna. <laughs> um, really enjoyed the, uh, the Premier League preview. All 20 clubs covered. So we're very much into extra time now on the Last Word with Stan Collymore podcast. Tell your friends if you enjoy uh, our work and our punditry. Number one at the moment. Let's stay there in the UK podcast charts. It's great to be back and uh, hopefully uh, you're enjoying our content. Hugh Wizzy joins me through the season and we're doing a new segment at the very end of the show. The news with Wizzy. Indeed we are. Here's your five stories. Today sees the launch of The Athletic, a subscription website with football's most prominent writers. Qatar has protests over the workers' death toll in the lead-up to the 2022 World Cup. We've got Wilfred Zaha training with his dad in some touching images online. Uh, Nangolan is going back on loan to his old club Cagliari for some interesting reasons. And Bedoya out in MLS now has been protesting against gun violence. Right, my very uh, short and sharp and uh, views on those stories. Let's start with the launch of The Athletic because it's come with a lot of fanfare and I was blown away. I was on the tube coming um, from central London out to uh, the Mirror uh, HQ in Canary Wharf and I was seeing journalist after journalist after journalist after journalist subscribe, buy, buy, buy and I was overwhelmed by it. Now, uh, as somebody that has proudly worked for, for the Mirror for 10 years, I like free. I like advertisers and sponsors to pay for content so that journalists can go out and do what they do. Paywalls have worked. Uh, of course, the Times has a, 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 has a very um, big paywall operation. And if you want to read the thoughts of Henry Winter, for example, you've got to pay for it. No problem. Journalism and journalists need to be paid. Um, but I'm not sure how this is going to work, if I'm going to be perfectly honest. I mean, there are regional guys. There are some big names. Danny Taylor from The Guardian. Big Forest fan uh, that I know uh, very well. Um, but it's a huge risk and a huge gamble. Why? Because I'm just thinking about myself as a fan. I already pay for Sky. I pay for BT. I pay for internet. I pay to go and watch my club and my country. Will I really go the extra yard to find content that is already going to be ready available? That's what newspapers and outlets have to wrestle with. So I'm not quite sure with uh, The Athletic, but I do wish them all very, very good luck. Let's go to the next one. Uh, Nyngolan, this is an incredible story, Hugh, that you really wanted to, to, to go with because of its, well, I'm quite emotion, passionate. Yeah. selflessness. I'm quite passionate about this because footballers do get a bad rep. They are called selfish the whole time. You know, it's all about the money. People don't really have loyalty to any club anymore. But this is in stark contrast to that. We've got a star player in Raja Nyngolan, plays for Inter Milan now, but is going back on loan to his old club. A big drop down in level for him. Why? Cagliari. 
Well, he's going back there to support his wife, who's actually dying of cancer right now. So just to be close to her, offer support and make sure that he's there for what could possibly be her dying days. So to me, it's a, a major move that shows that people in the game aren't always just about the money. We wish uh, Nine Garland all the very, very best and uh, his wife in... Uh her battle against cancer. Uh, I lost my sister to it 25 years ago and uh, it is, uh, well, everybody knows what cancer does and what it does to families. So uh, I'm sure they'll get lots of love from the football family and the passionate fans of uh, that big Sardinian team, of course, Cagliari. Let's go. Let's lighten the mood just a little bit. Will Zahar training with his dad. I saw this clip. He had a pink Manchester United shirt, which I thought, he's going to go to Man United. He's telling me, he's, and I thought, oh, he's, he, he played for Man United and he got biffed off by uh, David Moyes. And, um, and it was Eric Bailly's shirt, which he probably swapped in a Premier League game. But we don't often see, and we always forget, we see the glamour, the glitz, the kind of, you know, um, Alexis playing the piano on his entrance to Manchester United. You forget these guys have all come from somewhere, and many of them have come from very modest circumstances. So to see a Premier League player with his dad setting up balls and men and goals and cones on the garden um, was quite something. Really touching. If anything, it shows that he is much more down to earth than people want to believe. You see these flashy images on Instagram with the cars and whatnot, but this was really a kid with his dad practicing at becoming a better footballer. And essentially, that's where it starts for everyone. So I think everyone can relate to it. Alejandro Bedoya, not a familiar name in the Premier League, but certainly in the MLS. Um, what's the background to that story? He went over to a microphone, didn't he? And did he share expletives or, or did we like what he said? A Scottish football fans will remember him. He played for Rangers back in the day. But an incredible moment, really, playing for Philadelphia Union in MLS against DC United. Bedoya has run over after scoring in the third minute to the corner where an on-field mic was located. And he's screamed, Congress... End gun violence now. Now, of course, we're on the back of like two massacres. When is this going to end? This this cycle of it's a, this is very much a football show. I don't want to get into politics at all, but often one bleeds into the other. And if we can have footballers, we saw Megan Rapinoe talking about LGBTQ plus issues at the World Cup uh, and about fair pay per, uh, for 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 women footballers. Uh, I remember Robbie Fowler uh, and I playing up front for Liverpool and Robbie Fowler wore a T-shirt in support of the Dockers. He got a fine for it, but he got his message very much across. I remember Sasa Churchic, a teammate of mine at Aston Villa, but when he was at Crystal Palace protesting against the NATO airstrikes on Sarajevo back in the day. So there is a long history and tradition of whether it be footballers or sportsmen uh, advocating political issues uh, when necessary and this is a fantastic one. We all want to see uh, the end to whether it be knife crime in London on the streets of the UK or gun violence in the UK. He gets a massive thumbs up to me, for me. And finally, uh, Qatar. Uh, they've been protesting again. Why? They have indeed. The death toll is rising drastically and World Cup workers have been out protesting because they want improved working conditions and some guarantee for their safety. Uh, reports in 2014 said that the death toll was already at 1,500. It's closer to 5,000 now. Uh, ridiculous amounts of people losing their lives, preparing us for a World Cup that so many say shouldn't be happening in the first place. I don't know where you stand on it, but it's marred in controversy, this one, and a lot of people are already turning their back because of the human rights issues. Yeah, I don't think I'll be going. Uh, it'll be my first World Cup that uh, I, I won't have gone to. Um, uh, several reasons. It's not a football country. That doesn't mean you shouldn't go because it's not a football country, but I think there are better options uh, of growing the game around the world. Um, I don't like the idea of a World Cup in the middle of a season and having a break and then coming back into it. Um, so I just don't think I'm going to go. I haven't got a great vibe about it. But I've got a recent history. Uh, Martin Ziegler of The Times reported on uh, this story uh, that involved me and Sol Campbell. Um, I was doing a World Cup show last year and I had a phone call out the blue. Would you like to present a seminar in London? And it was basically, and I asked and I asked and I asked again, who's it for? It's around the Qatar World Cup. We can't really say much more. But, but lots of people went to it. Louis Sahar went to it and spoke at it. Um, uh, Hope Solo, I think, was a speaker at it. Uh, so there were some very serious people that Greg Dyke went and spoke to it, spoke uh, at it. But um, but basically, Sol Campbell and I were sort of pushed and pushed and pushed um, and asked if we would be involved to essentially be sort of 
either pro or anti Qatar. So I was very much embroiled in uh, a story that broke a few weeks ago. Sol didn't have anything to do with it. I didn't have anything to do with it in the end. But it just goes to show that, you know, sportsmen being involved and asked to join a side is very much where we're at in that part of the world. So uh, that's your news with Hugh Wizzy. The Last Word with Stan Collymore. We're nearly at the end of episode one of The uh, Last Word with Stan Collymore, but it'd be remiss of me to not go through the fixtures. Opening day of the Premier League, I remember it as a fan going back in the day and as a player. Liverpool start proceedings on Friday night against Norwich City. Some of the highlights down the league. West Ham United on Saturday at lunchtime. They have a showdown nearly at noon with the champions of England, Manchester City. Crystal Palace against Everton two teams hoping to get in the top half of the table this season or about Spurs in their brand spanking new stadium for the first full season at the new White Hart Lane face Aston Villa newcomers up the Villa and then on Sunday it's East meets West Midlands as Leicester City face Wolverhampton Wanderers Newcastle United host Nicholas Pepe and his £72 million worth of talents. And finally, it's locking horns. It's Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, Manchester United club legend, against Chelsea and Frank Lampard, Chelsea club legend. We can't wait for the football. Come on! Stan Collymore. That's the first episode of The Last Word with Stan Collymore done. Thanks to CT1, voted the number one sealant and adhesive in the UK many times. One of those reasons being it reduces your carbon footprint, being the snag list eliminator and lasting up to 25 years. If you're a tradesman or you love DIY and you haven't used it, you should. It doesn't smell. Bonus, we'll bond practically anything. It's the ultimate solution for sealing showers, baths and guttering. Next week on The Last Word with Stan Collymore, we'll be taking a look back at the action from round one of the Premier League, who will be the stars of the weekend, who are going to disappoint, uh, who will start the season off with a bang. I'm delighted to be joined by a man that started his Liverpool career alongside yours truly, going back to 96-97 season, a certain Jamie Carragher. From me, Hugh Wizzy and the team at The Last Word with Stan Collymore, see you next week. This is a Listening Dog Media production.